Well, I want to start off by asking you, if you have a phone or you have a journal or something, I want you to write down two sets of names. I want you to write down two sets of names. The first set of name that, names I want you to write down are those people that you just love to be around. You just love them. You can't get enough of them. It's, it, sometimes it feels like they can't do anything wrong. And it doesn't have to be one person. It could be multiple people. The second list are those people's doppelgangers, for lack of a better term. Those people you do not like. If I asked you to give me one thing that... Um, you think is wrong in their life, you would give me 10. Who are those people? Write down their names. And just keep them to the side, because we'll get back to them. As Pastor Ty said, um, we just got done in Young Adults doing a series on the atonement. Um, when the Lord gave me that word, I was like, Lord, I'm super excited. I just don't know if anybody else is going to be excited about a series on the atonement. So uh, just a really quick explanation of what is the atonement. Today is Yom Kippur. It is the day of atonement within the feasts of the Lord. And really what the atonement comes down to is there was a relationship that was broken. And we needed the Lord to reconnect us. And so the title of our series was Reconnect. And there's a lot more that I could go through that I don't really have time to go through today. But I, I want to challenge us with this as an overarching theme today. The Lord calls us to behold him, to become more like him. And as we become more like him, because we behold him, he reconnects everything in our life that's broken. He restores all the broken places. And so as, as we do a Bible study tonight, looking at the Lamb of God and how he has done that and is doing that in our lives, I want you to just take this time to behold him and say, Lord, how can I look more like you? So, without further ado, we are going to start in Leviticus 16. If you don't know, the Lord is a master orchestrator. He knows the end from the beginning and the beginning from the end. And what I love about our faith is God knew exactly what he was going to do in the end when he started in the beginning. So from the very beginning, we see evidence of Jesus throughout the scriptures. And if I had time, we would go through all of those Old Testament books. And we would explain where Jesus showed up in all of them. We have um, past YouTube messages that, that go through that. There's specifically, Pastor Ty gave a message a number of years ago now on Yom Kippur. It really does a great job showing you the imagery. Okay, tonight I don't have time to go into that. So I'm just going to briefly touch on it. So we know in the garden, God creates man and woman. He creates them in his image. And he gives this prophecy that there's sin that has happened, but, but the, the seed of the woman was going to come. And that's Jesus. Then we, so, so God allows this system to be created and sin to enter in. There is a problem. And that sin's result was death and separation. That is what sin did. It brought death and separation, not only between us and God, but even between one another. And so God introduces in Leviticus this system of atonement. So this happens right after the sons of Aaron reach out, try to stabilize the ark. They die because they're not properly relating to God. 
And this is what they set up. Leviticus 16, 7 through 10. He shall take the two goats and present them before the Lord at the door of the tabernacle of the meeting. Then Aaron shall cast lots for the two goats, one lot for the Lord and the other lot for the scapegoat. And Aaron shall bring the goat on which the Lord's lot fell and offer it as a sin offering. That goat was innocent. It did nothing wrong. But the goat on which the lot fell to be the scapegoat shall be presented alive before the Lord to make atonement upon it and to let it go as the scapegoat into the wilderness. And if, if you know, they didn't just let this goat go. They actually walked it towards a cliff and pushed it off. Because this was the day where all the sins of Israel were going to be atoned for. They were going to be made right. They were going to let those sins get kicked off the cliff and die so that they could have right connection with the Lord again. Sounds like somebody? So then we see in Leviticus 23, now on the 10th day of the seventh month is the day of atonement. That's tonight. It shall be for you a time of holy convocation and you shall afflict yourselves and present a food offering to the Lord and you shall not do any work on that very day for it is the day of atonement to make atonement for you before the Lord your God. From the very beginning, God knew he had a story to tell. So he set up a system where he allowed for sin. He allowed there to be a break in covenant and then he created a system where he was going to start to highlight who the Christ was going to be. And one of the things that he highlights is this Christ was going to be the scapegoat for our sin. He was going to carry our sin upon him and he was going to be crushed. He was going to be killed. And then we fast forward to Isaiah. Isaiah. Chapter 53, many of you Bible students know this is the chapter of the suffering servant. This is the, the, the great prophecy of God's Messiah that he was going to send. If the Lord hadn't set up a system where there was already animal sacrifice, this would make no sense. But God was setting up the dominoes. It says he was oppressed, speaking of Jesus, and he was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth like a lamb that was led to the slaughter and like a sheep that goes before the shearers is silent. So he opened not his mouth. And throughout the Old Testament, we see these little pictures of this Messiah that was covering, coming, this suffering servant. And from the very beginning, the Lord is... Um, giving his people these pictures so that when the perfect time arrived, Jesus shows up on the scene and he becomes our sacrificial lamb. There's, it's easy to look back and say, he is, he is the Messiah. He is the Lord. So we go into the New Testament. John says, chapter one, this is John the Baptist Verse 29, the next day he saw Jesus coming towards him and said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Say that with me. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. This is what we're called to. To behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And so then in Hebrews 13, we see it spelled out for the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the holy place by the high priest as a sacrifice for sin are burned outside the camp. So Jesus also suffering outside the gate in order to sanctify the people through his own blood. 
that we are sanctified by his blood. And then we have 1 John 4.10. And this is love. Not that we have loved God, but that he loved us. How did he love us? He sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. The word of atonement isn't found in the New Testament unless you're reading the Amplified Version. They use words like reconcile and propitiation. There was a relationship. It was broken. And the only way for that relationship to be mended was blood had to be shed. And then in Revelation 14, then I look, and there that word is, behold, on the Mount of Zion stood the Lamb. Hmm. Good news. The Lamb of God is mentioned six times in the book of Revelation because it's all about Jesus. So we see this really quick overview. From the very beginning, God had a plan. And it was pointing towards the, his Messiah because that was the story God has been telling from the beginning that he so loved his world that he gave his son to make a way where there was no way. We turn to Romans 5. And let's just take a moment to look at how Jesus is our lamb on this day of atonement. But God shows his love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by our works. No, by his blood. Much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For while we were still enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. Much more. Now that we are reconciled, we will be saved by his life. More than that, if that wasn't enough, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have received reconciliation. This word reconciliation is huge. It's, it's one of those synonyms to the word atonement. Because remember, it's a broken relationship. On that list you wrote down, you have some people that you might need some reconciliation with. As we process through this tonight, as we behold the lamb, the lamb who chose to love and chose to be just, to reconcile, could it be? that as we behold him, we will become more like him. And this next passage will become increasingly true in your life and in my life. 2 Corinthians 5. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, the new has come. All this is from God who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us, what? The ministry of reconciliation. God did not call us to just, I'm glad me and you are right. It doesn't stop there. He called us to say, me and you are right. Now let me get me and you right and let's get you and him right and let's go around and let's reconcile. We are agents of reconciliation. And therefore, as ambassadors of Christ, God making his appeal through us, through me and through you, we implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. That's the atonement, folks. 
that we, we behold the Lamb of God who is slain. And as we behold him, we become more like him. So that's the setup. Now the application. It's not enough just to know about it. And it's not enough just to have the background knowledge, though that's a lot of fun. But I want to present to you, there are two characteristics of who God is that were absolutely necessary for the atonement. One was his justice. Christ had to die, the Bible says. If justice was not an issue, then Christ wouldn't have died. He wouldn't have shed his blood. But God required justice. He is a good God. He is righteous. And because he is a righteous king, he required a sacrifice to be made for my sin and for your sin and for the sins of our world. This is important. Jesus had to die. Some people outside the faith will point at it and they'll say, how can a good God kill his own son? To which the response is, because he had to be just. Justice had to be served. So we look at verses like 2 Peter. For if God did not spare the angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to chains of gloomy darkness, he didn't even give them a second chance. He didn't save them. Did God have to save us? Or Luke 24, 25, verse 25 and 26. And he said to them, O foolish ones and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets had spoken. Was it not necessary that Christ should suffer these things and enter into glory? Justice was necessary for the atonement. Or Romans 3.26. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the ones who have faith in Jesus. That justice was absolutely necessary. The other attribute of God that was absolutely necessary is the one that we think of more often. It's the love of God. God was just with the angels. He just didn't save them. But with us, the atonement for God to atone for our sins, he had to bring justice and he had to bring love. So we know John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. That, that love was necessary. Or Romans 5.8, but God shows his love for us that while we were still sinners... Christ died for us. There was a justice and there was a love that was required for this to happen. Which one do you love more? The love of God or the justice of God? What I propose to us tonight is that many of us lean a little bit one way or a little bit the other. And the lack of balance in your life is causing problems. So what I'm presenting tonight is that as we behold the lamb, let us look at his love and look at his justice and say, in my life, Lord, help me to see where I need to bring more of your justice or where in my life do I need to bring more of your love? So we see John 1, 36. And we look at Jesus 
as he walked by and said, behold the Lamb of God. 1 John 3, 2. Beloved, we are God's children now. And what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him. Because we shall see him as he is. That God is calling us to be imitators. Because some of us in this room right now are thinking, I can't be like Jesus. I mean, I know what you're saying, Pastor. I'm supposed to be his love and be his justice, but I'm already tuning out because I'm just doing me. And to you, I would say you have to wrestle with Ephesians 5. The Bible calls you, therefore, be imitators of God as his beloved children. And he doesn't call you to be an imitator of himself and not equip you to do it. God doesn't do that. He equips who's called. And if you're a Christian, you're called. So let's focus on love. For those of us that like to focus on love, that lean the love direction. We're the ones that love to spend time with people. We love to get down on their level. Sometimes we call it a pastoral gifting. We think of verses out of Hebrews chapter 217. Therefore, he has made us to be like his brothers in every respect so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of God. See, there's the propitiation of God. We know that we're called to suffer on their behalf. So Hebrews 2.10, right before that, for it was fitting that he, for whom and by whom all things existed in bringing many sons to glory, should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. Well, if Christ suffered, then I'm called to suffer. And that's true. So I'm going to suffer with this person in my life. And that's the love of God acting out through you. Or could be. Or Philippians 3.8. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. You'll notice that there's a pattern here. You know what's part of love? Suffering. Not my definition. This is love. He who would lay his life down for his brother. You're not loving just because you like to say nice things to people and give them compliments. That's not the definition of love. Love is I'm willing to suffer for your sake that you may grow. That I, would, that I would hurt, that that would help. Now, sometimes um, that gets misinterpreted. And so we say, I love you so much that I'm not going to yell at you right now because that's not what you need but they're acting the fool. And no one's telling them. Or maybe you're the one that leans towards love. So you say, it's okay if it hurts me. It's okay if it costs me something. I just, you know, I just don't want to get into it. And when someone says, hey, I, I really don't think that's a good choice, you say, well, I just, I want to be loving. And I would ask you, are you reflecting the Lamb of God? Some of us, we lean towards justice. Being overly loving is not our issue. I was telling someone today, 
Me personally, I lean towards, you know what I asked, with my kids especially, you know what I asked. I don't need to warn you what the consequence is going to be. I'm just going to give you the consequence. Because I asked you once, you didn't do it, so consequence. No warnings. <laughs> so some of us focus on justice. We really love verses like Hebrews 10, 30. For we know him who said, vengeance is mine and I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people and he's going to judge you too. And we, if you've been here on Sundays, you know that God has called us to judge in the church. Luke 12, 57. And why do you not judge for yourself what is right? We are called to make judgments within the church. That is scriptural. 1 Corinthians 5, 12 and 13. For what have I to do with judging outsiders? Is it not those inside the church whom you are to judge? God judges those outside the church. Purge the evil person who's in your midst. But then this too gets misinterpreted. And we get legalists and Pharisees and just condemnation. Acts 15, verse 10. Now therefore, why are you putting God to the test by placing a yoke on the necks of the disciples that neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? We are so quick to correct people, but we never turn that finger around. And most of us in this room, I imagine, have interacted with those very people. You might be one of them. As a parent, why can't you pick up your room? Dad, why is your room such a mess too? <laughs> Maybe it's road rage and getting angry at the drivers that don't know how to drive. Who'd you cut off? How are you speeding? How many stop signs did you roll through? Did you use your turn signal? So when we lean towards love, the, the error that often we fall into is just hyper grace. Everything is okay. God's got it covered. His blood covers. And we kind of just do whatever. Because I love you. And God loves you. And that is true. On the other side, we lean towards the justice of God and, the, and we, we have a lot of judgment and a lot of condemnation. God calls you to live holy. If you're a Christian, you don't sin. Didn't you read 1 John? Stop sinning. And in both camps, we forget to behold the Lamb of God and say, what did the Lamb of God do? Who was he? What was he like? How can I be more like him? Jesus, make me look more like you. God calls us to be image bearers. We see that in Genesis. That he created us originally in his image. And though sin has come and the fall has passed, 2 Corinthians 3.18 tells us that we all with unveiled faces beholding the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. We should never be satisfied 
with not fully reflecting him yet? The answer is not to try to fix it. The answer is as you behold him, as you look upon him, you will be transformed from glory to glory. You will learn how to represent God's love and justice more and more as you behold his love and his justice. So here are some tests. I, I think of David in the scriptures. You know, David, King David wasn't a perfect man. He made some mistakes. Many of you Bible students know when he had committed his sin with Bathsheba and he had killed Uriah, the prophet comes to him and says, David, I have a story to tell you about a rich man who stole a poor man's lamb. And David's justice rose up. Here's the test. When the prophet flipped that script and said, David, you're the man, David didn't defend himself. He said, you're right, I deserve the punishment. It's okay to love the justice of God as long as it goes both ways. That's a really good test for you. Do you receive the justice of God? Do you allow him to discipline you as the child that he loves? Because if you do, that's a, that's a good, healthy place to be. If you don't, there's a problem. Likewise, we have healthy habits of love. Jesus was loving people, pouring out himself, healing multitudes. But in the midst of that, Jesus was totally okay with saying, I have to go and be refreshed by the Father. Do you have healthy boundaries of love in your life? Are you willing to say, I can't love and serve you because I need to go be refreshed? Or do you just pour yourself out so you're empty and you just keep pouring? I would suggest that that's not loving. <laughs> Good stuff. Now, the good news is, I don't have to listen to each one of your situations and tell you where you're missing it or where you're on the mark. We have a Holy Spirit for that. Praise God. Not only do we have a Holy Spirit, but I would highly, highly recommend going asking those that are close to you, how am I doing at representing the love and justice of God? Because you might think you know but I'm pretty sure that those outside of you have a better idea. If you're a parent, please go ask your kids. I'm serious. I asked my kids a question this week. I was like, I hope I know what your answer is, but, but I want to submit myself to the reality of what you're experiencing. We had a family meeting. I said, one of my goals over the last month is be more intentional and be at home more with my family. So this last Monday, kids, how's daddy doing at being present at home? And I was like, and they're like, you're doing a lot better. And I was like, praise God. But if, if my child was going to say, what? You still work too much. Why, why are you asking? Could I humble myself to that child and say, you know what? You're right. God can speak through anybody. Here's some other just scenarios I would, I would ask you to consider. 
when it comes to the topic of love and justice, a lot of people, um, not a lot, but some people find themselves in a pattern of abuse. Where in the name of love, they're not going to speak up. And I, I want to just challenge us for a minute to consider that it is not loving to endure abuse. If, and the evidence of it that you know that it's unhealthy is you feel helpless. Now, what I cannot say as a Christian is you should never be in a system or in a situation where um, you're receiving attack. Jesus was abused. Can we agree with that? Paul was abused. Every apostle was abused. But they knew their identity. They were absolutely confident in that. And they said, God has called me to this. Paul was very clear. People said, don't go to Jerusalem. He says, no, my eyes are set. I know what my God has called me to. As Christians, that are obedient to the Lord, you will go through suffering. And my hope is that we would be able to walk into that with love in our hearts for those very people that abuse us because we know who we are and we just can't wait till they figure out who they are. We're like, you can treat me wrongly and that hurts, but man, I'm excited for you. It is so exciting when you see that happen. I've seen that happen. It is, it's just so much fun when you see that 180 turn in their life and they used to attack you, but now they're like your friend. It's only God. Likewise, I would be very careful if you find yourselves on the justice side. Um, there's people that find themselves in, um, for lack of a better word, they call it discernment ministry. And, and, and they really believe that God has enabled them to tell everybody else where they're wrong. Now, I believe in discernment, folks. I hope you do. If you don't, we have a problem. But be careful when all you see is a list of wrong. Jesus looking at the churches in Revelation, he doesn't see all wrong. So look back at that list of names that you wrote down. Those people that you just can't love enough. My application question for you is, have you been willing to represent God's justice in their life? Or in the name of love, have you been unwilling to correct them when they need it? Because the Bible says, if you hate your kid, you won't correct them. And that's not just true for your child. I had, a, I had a guy I knew, he was sinning. He was not a Christian. He was stealing from the company. He was lying about his time card. If I'm honest, I wasn't interested in loving him. I was interested in turning him in. Holy Spirit was very clear with me. Do not say you love my people and you turn him in. You need to confront him. I didn't want to give him the justice of God. Frankly, I didn't know what he was going to do. But I did, because me looking like the lamb was more important than whatever he was going to do to me. So I confronted him on it. He denied it. And the next day, he repented. He made it right. He fixed it. Praise God that man didn't have to live with the consequences of what he was doing, because that would not have been good for him. If you love people, you will bring the justice of God. Now look at that list of people that if I asked you to name one thing that was wrong, you would name 10. 
Have you been willing to represent the love of God in their life? Let's behold the lamb. While you were yet sinners, Christ kept judging you. No. There is nobody that is too far gone. We would agree to that in our heads theologically. In your actions, do you refuse to speak ill against those that deserve it? Because you're going to speak life and hope. Doesn't mean you need to lie. You can look at them straight in the face. Jimmy, you're making some crazy decisions, but you know what? I love you and God's got a plan for you. That still holds true. While they are yet sinning, God still has a plan. He still has hope for them. He is still calling them. So on that second list, I would ask you to prayerfully reach out to those people on purpose and speak life. If you have people that you find yourself on the judgment side, be intentional about purposely loving them. They probably need it. And if you have yourself other people that you find that you lean towards loving, and if you're honest, it's not because they're doing everything right, it's just because you're afraid, then do them a favor and bring the justice of God. Tell them honestly what's going on. They need it. And for the glory of our lamb that was slain, it brings him glory when we reflect him. I'm going to close with this verse. 2 Corinthians. We've already read it. I'm reading it again. Chapter 5, verse 17 through 20. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. That means you. You are a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, not from your good works, not from your good thinking. That comes from God, who through Christ has reconciled us to himself and given us, given you the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their, their trespasses against them. He did not keep that list of 10, 20 things that was wrong with them. And he entrusted to us the message that they too can be reconciled to God. Therefore, we are ambassadors of Christ, God making his appeal through us. God is calling you to be his love and his justice. So I implore you, reconcile yourself to the Lamb of God. Behold the Lamb of God who is slain. And as we behold him, we will become more like him. And we will more fully represent his love and his justice.